Back in the 1980s, sword and sorcery films were a bit of a go-to genre, as all you needed really was some open spaces, a strapping hero in a leather loincloth, and perhaps some buxom beauties who were in some sort of trouble. Probably had something to do with a wizard, too. One person who saw a great opportunity to make one was probably not the first one you would think of. After making a couple of family-friendly films, Don Coscarelli burst onto the scene with Phantasm. This fever dream of a film caught the imagination of audiences everywhere as the tall man began to haunt their dreams. More importantly, film executives were paying attention to how well the film had done. Coscarelli now could line up his next picture. He wanted to create a fantasy film about a hero who could talk to animals. The Beastmaster was about to be born. When it came time to actually film the movie, Coscarelli would soon find that the real horror of his life may be bringing this film to life. So let's find out exactly what happened to the Beastmaster here on What the F*** Happened to This Movie? Riding the success of Phantasm, he was ready to do his next film and had been thinking about a book he read when he was a kid called The Beastmaster. He liked the concept of the book where the hero had the ability to telepathically talk to animals. The rest of the story didn't quite interest him as it took place in the future. Instead, he decided to set it in the past in a medieval type story involving magic, swords, and a deposed prince. Some of the films he loved as a kid were the Hercules films starring Steve Reeves. He combined elements from both the book and these types of films and came up with what would become the Beastmaster. Coscarelli would say that he combined some of his favorite elements from Japanese samurai films and Disney animal movies as well. <laughs> In the film, a king is dethroned by his evil consort. As part of the plan, the king's unborn son is taken from his pregnant wife by a witch. Her intention is to sacrifice the baby to ensure that the prophecy of the king's son killing the consort doesn't come true. Before she can act, a villager stumbles upon her and kills her. He takes the baby home with him and raises it as his own. Many years later, the baby has grown up and found that he has an incredible ability to talk to animals. His village is ransacked by a horde called the Jaun. He is the only survivor and sets out to avenge the death. Along the way, he encounters different animals that he befriends. There's a black panther, played by a dyed tiger, two curious ferrets, and even an eagle. He soon runs into Kiri, who he becomes infatuated with. While trying to follow her, he then runs into Seth and Tal. He decides to journey with them back to a sacred temple in hopes of finding Kiri again. When they arrive, he learns of Mayax, who sacrifices children for the sake of the village. As viewers, we know this is the evil consort that orchestrated the kidnapping of the Beastmaster years before. Now, he must help his new friends and rescue his father, the king, who is still alive and imprisoned inside of the castle. All of this is set in the medieval world where magic is real and everyone's adept at using a sword. Don Coscarelli began shopping the script around, but none of the studios seemed to be that interested. A lot of times it's very difficult to talk these studio types into your vision. One of the foreign distributors of Phantasm had caught wind that he was working on a new script and told him they were interested in investing in this film. Don agreed, but was not ready for what their contributions would bring. They would have almost $5 million to make the film, which is the biggest budget that Coscarelli had up to that point. The problem started almost immediately. They started to get rewriting notes from his new producers. This was something Coscarelli hadn't encountered before, as all of his previous movies had been made independently. On those films, he had the final say on everything. There was no way that we could, uh, you know, make this for $200,000 or Phantasm style budget. That wasn't going to happen. As casting was starting, it was apparent right away that the money men were going to have way more of a say in the making of the film than Don thought. They began overruling some of the actors he wanted to hire. Don had met with an 18-year-old Demi Moore for the role of Kiri. 
She was excited to do the part, and Don thought she would be great. He was immediately overruled, as the producer said they didn't think Demi Moore was a very good actress. After that, Coscarelli met with famously eccentric actor Klaus Kinski to play the part of Mayax. Kinski was on board, but was asking for more money than what the entire budget was. Coscarelli knew what he could bring to the role, and said he would find the money somewhere else in the budget to make the casting happen. Once again, he was vetoed. The role of Mayax would end up with Rip Torn. When he showed up to set to meet the director, he had his own ideas of things that should be incorporated into the character. Torn wanted Mayax to look like a turkey vulture. Are you sure that this is completely necessary? Uh, necessary? Is it necessary for me to drink my own urine? Probably not. No. But I do it anyway because it's sterile and I like the taste. He suggested a prosthetic nose to help accentuate this look. Coscarelli agreed that it did end up giving Mayax an interesting scowl, but that the problems with the nose piece on set probably weren't worth it. While shooting during the day in California, if they were outside, the piece would start to melt. Even though they were shooting during the winter, the sunshine would still affect some of the special effects. This would cause delays in some of these scenes as the effect then had to be pieced back together. And Rip is a very creative actor, and he came in with this notion that he was going to play the role as a turkey vulture. Coscarelli would also find out very quickly why the two big rules when making a movie are don't work with animals and don't work with children. <laughs> They had set up a meeting with an animal trainer for the film, as they were going to need some Black Panthers for the role of Rook, ferrets for the roles of Kodo and Poto, and an eagle for Charak. The trainer said he had a Black Panther that would be perfect for the role, and that the other should be no problem at all. Don was happy and ready to work with them, but quickly found out that the producers had gone behind his back and made a deal with a smaller animal training company. When Don met with them, he found they didn't have any panthers at all. Instead, they would be using four different tigers. When Don mentioned that Ra was supposed to be a black panther, as he didn't want to deal with the stripes, the trainers mentioned that they would just dye the tigers black. During pre-production, Don was told that while the tiger was on set, none of the child actors could be present. Also, a sharpshooter had to be in place with a rifle aimed at the tiger at all times. This completely ruined some of the scenes of the movie that had been planned. Some quick rewrites and the use of short doubles had to be used to fix this last minute stipulation. Quiet. This beast is fierce. On the first day Mark Singer was on set, they were filming the scene where Dar discovers his powers when a bear comes out of the forest and threatens his father. The bear was a Russian bear and was the only one working in Hollywood at the time. When the bear came out of the forest, he immediately began attacking his handler. The cast and crew went running from the set and locked themselves in nearby vehicles until the bear had been recaptured. The handler went off to the hospital and the crew then told Mark it was his turn to film his scenes. This did not deter Singer though. He would later state that he tried to let the animals know he understood that they were in charge on the set. He claimed that the main tiger used in the film named Kipling was the first performer he said good morning to when he showed up and the last one he said good night to. Singer says this led them to having a great working relationship on the film which kind of shows up in the movie. His character is constantly patting the large cat on the side and back throughout the film. Probably the biggest diva on the set was the eagle that they were using on the film. Singer claimed that it didn't like him at all. The bird would refuse to fly on cue most of the time. They had to put the eagle in a closed basket and then attach it to a helium balloon. It would fly up high enough and they would unlatch the basket using radio control. They would then film the bird flying back down to the ground. This caused numerous delays. Singer says that during the scene where he pulls out his sword for the first time, the bird was supposed to fly by, but instead opted to attack him. It used one of its talons to cut him right on his right shoulder blade all the way down to his left kidney. When my back was turned, she took off way up high and came down and hooked me with a talon and left a, a zipper down my back, you know, that sort of thing. The easiest animals it seemed to work with may have been the ferrets. While they couldn't really be trained to do many tricks or skills, they were heavily food motivated. Many times they would just place food where they needed them to go, and they would happily run to that spot. A couple of things were able to be done. 
such as one of the ferrets running with keys in its mouth. But luckily, not much was really required of them. One of the biggest hurdles of the animals being on set was the final shot of Dar, Kiri, and Ra on the top of the mountain as a helicopter was flying around getting the shot. The tiger was chained down so he couldn't move very far, and an animal trainer was hidden in a nearby rock. They were worried the helicopter would spook the tiger and cause him to lash out. Luckily, no problems. When it came time to do close-ups for that scene, Coscarelli had an idea, but the trainers told him he was crazy. He had hoped that he could get a shot of one of the ferrets poking out of Dar's pouch and interacting with the tiger. They told him that the tiger would probably try and eat the ferret. He asked if they could try, and they reluctantly agreed. The tiger had been heavily fed after all, so he wouldn't have much of an appetite. Then, every trainer was on hand just in case they needed to immediately separate the tiger from everyone else. They rolled camera, and they pushed the ferret up. His head poked out, and the tiger looked over. The two animals quickly smelled each other, so it looks like they're touching noses. Don said cut, and very quickly they separated the ferret from the tiger. They nailed the shot, and as it ends the film, it works beautifully. The animals weren't the only issues the crew had on set. Don Coscarelli, in his book True Indy, suggests that the relationship between him and star Mark Singer didn't get off to the best start. He said during one scene, Dar was supposed to be charging at the camera, and he would run past. They would cut and move on to the next scene. But when they filmed it, Singer charged at the camera, ran past it, and then purposely collided with Don, who was sitting in his chair. He would end up flipping backward in his chair and falling to the ground. Singer began to laugh with the rest of the crew at the director's expense. He felt that he was being hazed on the film and wasn't really sure why. They seemed to get along fine by the time the film was done, but there was some back and forth during filming that Coscarelli doesn't look back on too fondly. Since they were filming during the winter, some of the cast didn't have a pleasant experience as they were required to wear very little. Singer would often describe his outfit as a leather hula skirt. He said that while filming the scene where Dar falls into the quicksand, that the crew behind the camera were all wearing parkas and gloves while he only had a loincloth on. Tanya Roberts was half naked and swimming in a pond. The waterfall behind her in this scene was man-made. The water was sent in to create the waterfall part, while the pond was all natural. As soon as they yelled cut, the crew would run over and wrap her in the blankets to keep her warm. Don's co-writer on the film, Paul Pepperman, says if you pay attention during that scene, you can see her discomfort with being in the cold water. It's not a, a whole lot of fun to be the only one who's naked on the set. I mean, not that I was, but I mean, I was nakeder than everyone else. I mean, everyone else was in duffel coats. Once the film wrapped, Coscarelli headed back to start the editing process. He was able to assemble his director's cut of the film, but was quickly kicked out of any further editing on the film. The producers took it over, and someone mentioned that the film seemed like it should be longer. The editor was then given instructions to lengthen every shot in the film. This gives the film a far slower pace, which changes some of the tone that Coscarelli was going for. He was also very upset that he wasn't able to be there for the creation of the optical effects. He says that some of them, like the dust cloud created in the distance by the horror, looks terrible. When Vinegar Syndrome put out their 4K version of the film, they offered Don a chance to come back and redo some of these effects. The original theatrical version and the new version with improved opticals are both offered in the set, meaning you can compare and contrast yourself. It would have been a different film if uh, Paul and I would have had control. The film came out and didn't receive much fanfare. It performed modestly, but ended up being overshadowed by the release of Conan the Barbarian a few months later, which is also a point of contention with Coscarelli, especially when he hears people say that the Beastmaster is just a Conan ripoff. He reminds people that they were in production at the same time and that his film was in no way connected to anything to do with Conan. With a small performance at the box office, office, everyone associated with the film figured it would disappear into history. What they didn't realize was that a few cable channels would create a cult following. They began to run it in constant rotation and fans finally began to discover or rediscover the film. Eventually, jokes began to make the rounds that the HBO actually stood for, hey, Beastmaster's on. Or that TBS meant the Beastmaster station. Whatever the situation, the film collected a hardcore group of fans. He already has the strongest right hand that any leader of men could want. 
Eventually, there was talk of a sequel. In what had to be more than a coincidence, the film Masters of the Universe was released five years after the original Beastmaster. In that film, the characters come from Eternia to Earth. This proved to be a cost-saving measure that helped keep the budget of the film from going out of control. In order to accomplish the same thing, the sequel to Beastmaster was given a similar plot. Dar is forced to go through a portal to Earth to keep his evil brother, not Tao, from stealing an atomic bomb and using it back in our world. Most of the action is set in present day LA. Don Coscarelli had sold his rights for any sequels or TV series, so all of them were made without his involvement. This also meant that he didn't receive any payments for the film either. The film was less well received than the last one, but would spawn one more movie, Beastmaster 3, The Eye of Braxis. This TV movie would once again see Dar meet up with his younger brother Tal, played by Casper Van Dien of course, who was now king. Seth was replaced with Tony Todd for this film. The budget was quite small, so the film looks a lot different than the others. It actually looks like it may have taken a few cues from Hercules and Xena. A few years later, the property would be turned into a TV series of the same name. The lead role was recast, with Daniel Goddard taking over the role of Dar. He would travel through different lands and use his power to help people. Mark Singer would later join the cast of the show as the character Dartanus. Even after some of the negative feelings about the film, Don Coscarelli still loves it and is glad he got to make it even though the finished product may not be what he wanted. According to Coscarelli, the original negative for Beastmaster has been lost. It was being stored at a residential house when the original owner moved and accidentally left the film canisters behind. The whereabouts of the film have never been discovered, but he has asked fans to look for the film. Back in 2020, Coscarelli regained the rights for the original film and hopes to find the negative to give it the proper upgrade. Along with a new transfer, his hopes are to reboot the franchise and see what new stories they can tell with Dar and the Animals. With today's technology, they might be able to get closer to his original intentions and see where that takes it. For those of us that grew up in the 1980s, Beastmaster became the live action He-Man movie we always wanted. No matter what strife the movie endured during the making of it, a whole generation grew up wanting to be Dar and to talk to animals. Thankfully, the film lets us relive our childhood and see the amazing story anytime we want. Oh, and what the f was up with those Mothman creatures?